from cabinet-sized monsters full of discrete components and point-to-point -point soldering to beige bulky boxes with monochromatic screens that fill our hearts with nostalgia, technology never stops evolving. With devices getting smaller and smaller and with the rise of the APU looming, is there even a future for discrete GPUs? Today I'll look at all the information that has surfaced recently regarding the big three. As it turns out, not only is their life still in these hulking appendages, but the GPU market is about to see the biggest revolution since its inception. Recently, a friend asked me to build a mini ITX media box for his living room, which came out looking pretty cool. But when it came time to activate Windows, the eBay seller I've been using was sadly no longer selling OEM keys. <laughs> Luckily, at around the same time, the folks at GameFun365.com reached out for a sponsor spot, so I bought a Windows 10 Pro key from their website to test it out, and it worked great on my buddy's new PC. So if you need cheap keys, I can recommend their offerings. You can also get Office 2019 keys and they work globally. Use the coupon code C20 for an additional 20% off. Link in the description. Starting with Nvidia, the recently leaked cooler photos have generated mixed feelings in the community, both regarding its veracity and its strange design. I ran a poll on Twitter after the initial leak and half the people who voted think the cooler is fake. The heatsink leak that followed seems to have given the initial leak more legitimacy for most people. So are we really looking at the RTX 3080 here? So you know how companies hire an industrial design house to design products for them, and they come up with a bunch of possible designs, usually 3D printed. Some companies even show this prototyping process in their marketing efforts, like when the Stadia remote was revealed. I think this is exactly that, a prototype, probably close to the final version of the GPU, but not necessarily assembly line ready. If you zoom in on the cooler without the shroud, you can see a bunch of imperfections. For instance, in this block here, the fins go upwards, whereas on this middle one, some of the fins are diagonal. In fact, to me, this portion doesn't even look like metal. It just looks like a solid block of plastic. It would be pretty hard to 3D print the rest of the fin array, but I think this whole thing might not be metal, at least in this particular leaked photo. To me, this looks like a validation molding to test fit the components. And trust me, Nvidia will want to test fit this one with the utmost precision. Looking through Twitter and Reddit, some people seemed confused as to how the air would flow through this cooler if the fins in the center seemed to be blocking the passage of air from one end of the car to the other. In reality, it doesn't actually matter how the fins are laid out. What really matters is the amount of surface area to dissipate heat. That's especially true in a design with heat pipes, of which we can see four in the image. Regardless of whether this is the final version or not, and this is actually metal or not, there's no way someone would go to the trouble of creating something this creative and complex just to troll, so I don't think this is fake. But on the other hand, there's no way Nvidia would release something with this lack of refinement. So the only possibility is that this is indeed a validation design, some sort of prototype. If this bottom portion is supposed to be metal fins and not plastic like we see in this leaked image, so if the whole length of the GPU has metal fins throughout, then the TDP must be enormous, probably between 300 and 400 watts. If, on the other hand, this portion of the card is just going to be plastic, as in this prototype, then I think something around the 250 watt range is more likely. I asked one of my patrons to create a more detailed render of the cooler than the ones that have been circulating, and he kindly agreed. My patrons are awesome like that. So a couple of things stand out to me. Firstly, the two fans have different types of blades, at least on this prototype. That could mean nothing. They could just be placeholder fans. Or it could mean that they serve different purposes, one optimized to push air out and the other one to draw air in, maybe pull air from the front end, exhaust from the back or vice versa. But still, why go through so much trouble and design such a strange looking GPU just for a push-pull configuration? Surely that could be done in a more traditional design with both fans on the front, right? 
If it wasn't for this awesome rotating animation that my lovely patron made, I have to say it was a bit hard to get my head around how this thing would even look seen from the back in a normal configuration. So what on earth is Nvidia thinking here? Well, I think it's time for one of those classic Cortex shots in the dark. I don't miss that much, but I've had some relatively embarrassing misses, like when I said that I could be a dual socket thread ripper this generation. I am pretty confident in what I'm about to reveal, but it's so wacky that I understand if you think this is crazy. Think about it. Why on earth would Nvidia be adding a fan to the back of the GPU? Well, why are there fans on the front? to cool the stuff that's on the front of the PCB, right? Do you see where I'm going with this? I believe that there's another die on the back of the PCB of the 380. In fact, I think all of the RTX GPUs will have a chip on the front and a chip on the back. The one on the front is the usual ASIC processor, what we know as a GPU, while the one on the back is an accelerator. And I think I even know what Nvidia is calling it the Traversal Coprocessor. I doubt most of you will remember this, but I did say in past videos that the first generation of RTX GPUs had embedded accelerators that Nvidia hadn't publicly disclosed, at least not to the gaming audience. Well, this new accelerator, the Traversal Coprocessor, is not embedded as the compression and decompression accelerators were in the first gen RTX, but rather a separate chip. And I believe each RTX GPU will have one of these on the back of the PCB. And that's not all. I also suspect that there will be dedicated standalone PCIe cards that you can buy to further improve ray tracing performance. These secondary cards will connect to the main GPU using NVLink. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So what does this traversal coprocessor do? And why is Nvidia making such a radical change? Well, first of all, let me reiterate that I could be completely wrong. <laughs> Maybe the there is no coprocessor. Maybe that cooler isn't even the actual cooler. Maybe there's nothing on the back. So don't burn me at the stake if I get this one wrong. But I can tell you this. I then just pulled this out of my vivid imagination. It's grounded on facts. Anyway, enough of covering my own PCB backside. The traversal coprocessor will be responsible for all the BVH calculations in real-time ray tracing, leaving more space on the actual GPU die for traditional rendering. Some people were surprised that Nvidia isn't hitting the radical limit this time around. And I believe this is the reason why. The ray tracing functionality is being split between the GPU and a dedicated accelerator. Now pay attention as I explain how this traversal coprocessor works. In basic terms, when a ray is cast, this coprocessor performs a test. It tests to see if that ray intersects a bounding volume. You see, in ray tracing, the stuff that you see on screen screen, the various objects like, say, a teapot, are put inside a bounding volume, like a cube type of shape. This coprocessor's job is to cull any of these bounding volumes that don't intersect with the ray that it's testing. Then it continues to test the stuff that the ray hits in smaller and smaller bounding volumes, like in a nested tree. So it's basically going all the way down to a leaf in that tree, if that makes sense. Once it reaches that leaf. In other words, once it gets to the geometric primitive, it does another test. This time, an accelerated rate primitive intersection test. And what on earth does that mean? <laughs> the coprocessor needs to know if that primitive is part of an object, in this case, the teapot. Then from these tests, the coprocessor can discover all the object primitives that the ray intersects. This is a lot more efficient than just casting billions and billions of rays at once at every single thing on screen. Maybe when we have quantum processors, we can do that. But there's another thing that this coprocessor can do. It can determine if that primitive that it tested against is repeated across the scene. So if there are multiple teapots in different positions and orientations, and even at different scales, they become represented as just an instance of the first object that was accelerated. This avoids replicating the BVH data multiple times in world space, saving not just on memory, but more importantly, on memory accesses. If you saw my video last month where I talked about the PS5 memory system, you might remember 
remember how I said that Nvidia lives by this rule of minimizing data movement as much as possible because that directly translates into energy consumption. It's also worth noting that the Traversal coprocessor is itself a highly parallel device, but it works by using MIMDs or multiple instructions, multiple data. If that sounds confusing, basically this just means that once each ray is sent to the coprocessor for testing, each ray is then handled independently. To me, this suggests that if this is a MIMD device, it can do any MIMD operation, not just BVH traversals. And if that's the case, this is going to turn the GPU market upside down. This is huge. I think it might be possible to use this accelerator for other operations that are similar in nature to ray tracing, like path tracing, and more importantly, photon mapping. That means real-time ray trace global illumination and in 4K or even 8K thanks to some of the algorithms that Nvidia showed a couple of months ago on their online developer conference videos. Now you might be thinking, if Nvidia had those compression and decompression accelerators that I mentioned in past videos inside the Turing GPU, they could just put this coprocessor inside of the Ampere GPU die also, right? Well, the thing is, there's a lot that this coprocessor has to do to ensure data doesn't need to go back and forth between it and the SMs. It can't just be a dumb device. It needs to be able to do a lot of things on its own, like for instance, discard some intersections by itself, as I exemplified a minute ago with that teapot, without needing SM intervention. In RTX 1, this was mostly done in software, and the heavy lifting was done entirely by the SMs, which was was incredibly inefficient. This traversal coprocessor removes the need of software processing and therefore the need for classification operations inside the SMs. It's all done by the coprocessor. As such, it needs a lot of silicon area to do so. Another advantage of separating functionality into different chips, like we saw with Ryzen, is that they can be manufactured at different foundries. We'll get to that bit in a minute. People have called the first generation RTX GPUs a trial run, and this second gen, assuming I'm correct in all of this, will prove exactly that. Compared to Ampere, the original RTX cards could barely do ray tracing. I suspect that the resulting performance of having this coprocessor will finally make real-time ray tracing viable at high resolutions and high frame rates. If you're old enough to remember when it was like when the rendering of 3D games was done by the CPU alone and how transformative it was for the industry when 3D accelerators were introduced, that might give you an idea of what the introduction of this traversal coprocessor will do for our niche and for gaming in general. Now of course, as many of you will remember, Nvidia did try a similar strategy before with PhysX, in that case having a dedicated accelerator for physics, and that then worked out that well for Nvidia. So is the traversal coprocessor going to follow the same fate? Well, firstly, if it's on the back of the PCB by default, as I suspect, then people buying an RTX GPU will already have an accelerator. So if Nvidia releases separate cars that only have this accelerator on them that you need to connect to the GPU via the NVLink, it's a very different situation to what we had with PhysX, because you will only be augmenting something that you already have. Secondly, Nvidia did spend the whole first generation RTX pushing ray tracing down everyone's throats, a gargantuan marketing effort to the point of renaming GTX to RTX, to the point of forcing the consoles to offer limited ray tracing as a headline feature. And it's a marketing strategy that worked. Now ray tracing is on everyone's minds, and that certainly wasn't the case with PhysX. And thirdly, at least from what I can gather, there's no need for developers to add support for the traversal coprocessor, as it just gets commands from the SMs on the GPU die. With developers adopting Microsoft's DXR API for developing games with ray tracing on consoles, Nvidia will simply translate the same commands as if they were directed at the SMs, which in turn send BVH data to be processed on the coprocessor by itself, without the developers or the API needing to explicitly intervene in this process. So yeah, I believe this is the reason this cooler 
is so weird. There's definitely something on the back there. There's a lot more to discuss, so you might want to take a break to take all of this in. Maybe take a moment to join my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Cortex, and then come back so that Nvidia can continue blowing our minds. Now before we move on to the other very exciting things that Nvidia is going to introduce, let's just quickly go over the mechanics of the Ampere leaked cooler and also speculate on performance. And yes, we'll get to Big Navi in a minute. As far as the size of the GPU is concerned, because PCI connectors are standard, we can extrapolate how large the GPU is going to be. It seems it's larger than the RTX 2080 overall, but the PCB is actually smaller at around 250. 20 mm squared. The cooler seems to be 291 mm wide and 105 mm tall. Here's the two GPUs next to each other for comparison. The power connectors are supposedly on the right end of the card. This means that there's a flexible cable that connects the power pin to the main PCB. If we place the full ampere die to scale where the heat pipes start, there is in fact enough space for 12 double layered memory chips. So 24 gigs of memory is definitely possible, but definitely not enough space for the memory plus the VRMs and power regulators and such, at least if they're anything like on the Titan RTX. You can have the memories in this symmetrical configuration or split like so. This probably means that in addition to the coprocessor on the back of the PCB, I think the power delivery system will also be moved there, either entirely or at least partially. It's hard to say exactly. As far as performance is concerned, as I already explained, real-time ray tracing will be processed magnitudes faster than on RTX 1, if my belief in the existence of this coprocessor is correct, and that's a huge if. So that's great for ray tracing, but what about traditional rasterization? We are actually in an interesting period because both AMD and Nvidia are moving to new nodes at the same time and also both with new microarchitectures. In my video covering the PS5 a couple of months ago, I already disclosed that RDNA 2 is being manufactured on N7+. Plus. So this isn't an enhanced 7 nanometer. This is a new node requiring new masks. It's a significant significant difference in terms of density. And looking at past generations of NVIDIA GPUs, we can get an approximate idea of how Ampere will perform. So if we plot in a graph the average frames per second that the top NVIDIA GPU got in each generation across 24 games, including GTA 5, Portal, Battlefield, etc., basically using aggregate benchmark numbers from Anantac and Tech Power Up, we get this line. So on the vertical axis we have the frames per second, and on the horizontal horizontal axis we have the generation of GPU. As you'd expect, GPUs got progressively faster with each generation in these same 24 games, at least up until Pascal. Now, how much of this absolute uplift in performance do you think can be attributed to improvements in architecture by Nvidia? Well, this might come as a surprise, but with the exception of the transition from Kepler to Maxwell, where there was a massive shift in energy efficiency, which did come from architectural improvements, the reality is that new architecture actors had barely any impact in the overall performance. If we plot a line through the average gains, you can see that despite what Nvidia and AMD are always claiming in their marketing materials, the reality is that the microarchitecture improvements contribute very little to the overall performance in each new generation, with a few occasional exceptions. Don't believe me? Well, if we plot the CMOS potential data from the foundries, so this is how much a fab like TSMC will project as a performance gain and efficiency improvements, we get this. As you can see, in six years or so, we got between four and six times more performance, but that's pretty much in line with what the foundry said the CMOS potential was. In other words, the changes in architecture in each Nvidia generation barely contributed anything to the absolute performance, except for Maxwell. And this is the same across all ASICs, FPGAs, 
batteries and of course even CPUs. Intel is the perfect example, with minor improvements to the 14 nanometer node corresponding to minor improvements in their CPU's performance over the last four or five years. That's how much node density matters. So don't believe these companies when they tell you that their new microarchitecture was responsible for an additional 30% performance or something like that. That's very rarely the case. And when it does happen, it's usually because the previous architecture was terrible. This is one of the semiconductor industry's biggest dogmas. Performance gains almost always follow in line with CMOS potential, with very little variation and many times below that potential. Now, there are multiple variants of 7 nanometer, so I'm going to assume here that Ampere is on regular 7 nanometer and not on 7 nanometer EUV or 7N+. So from 12 nanometer TSMC to 7 nanometer TSMC, which is the transition that Ampere will have, TSMC projects between 30 to 35% CMOS potential improvement. So if Ampere were to come out with the exact same specs and die sizes during, it would be at best around 35% faster but the rumors that are circulating indicate that MP is actually going to be between 505 mm squared and 627 mm squared, depending on who you ask, compared to the gargantuan 754 mm squared of the 2080 Ti TU102 die. So my expectation regarding the top Ampere GPU versus the top Turing GPU is a very conservative 25% uplift in raster performance. I can could be totally wrong and this is assuming Nvidia is using the regular 7 nanometer node and as for ray tracing performance it's impossible to say really because there's nothing to compare the traversal coprocessor to so it could be twice as fast or 10 times faster than RTX Gen 1 for all we know. I'm not claiming it's 10 times faster in ray tracing I'm saying it's impossible to know at this point. There are also rumors circulating that there's also an RTX 3090 this time around, which I guess could be a dual chip GPU just to hold on to the performance crown, similar to what AMD did when they launched the RX 295X2, which was technically the fastest GPU available at the time in games that supported Crossfire, as it was just two 290Xs on a single board. I think the 3090 is exactly that, just a way for Nvidia to claim performance leadership, even if support for SLI is limited. I'm not entirely convinced that the 3090 is a dual chip card, but I think it's the most likely scenario. Now, as far as pricing is concerned, it's anyone's guess, and honestly, I doubt that that's already been decided. If I were to guess, I would expect prices in line with what we saw in the previous generation. The 3080 should be 699 and offer the same performance as a 2080 Ti, give or take, perhaps a bit better. Plus, the the traversal coprocessor, of course. The 3080 Ti, I think, will be 999 effectively, instead of being announced at 999 and then being sold for 1200. And the 3090 will have Jensen parting like it's 1999. At least that's my guess. If there is a new Titan, and remember there are multiple variants of 7 nanometer, my guess is that it will be on 7N plus or 6N and cost around $2,500 probably coming out next year at some point. I think the 3080 Ti will be the first GPU that can do 4K at over 100 FPS, even with ray tracing being used. And if it stays at $1,000, I think it might be worth it to those who have deep pockets, because this time around, the ray tracing capabilities will actually make a difference to overall image fidelity, and it will look far superior to the ray tracing on the consoles, which I believe will be limited to reflect and shadows, whereas the Ampere GPUs will be able to do ray traced global illumination, which is a game changer. It's also likely that the RTX GPUs will come bundled with Cyberpunk, at least the top SKUs, and that the game will make heavy use of the traversal coprocessor. Cyberpunk could be the killer app that Nvidia needs to finally make RTX worth the investment. If prices stay the same, I don't think these GPUs will be as a catastrophic investment as the first 
best RTX generation was. If Nvidia raises the prices, I think the vast majority of people will simply move to the consoles. No amount of graphical eye candy will get people to spend thousands of dollars in the current political and financial climate. The last thing I'll say, and this one is 100% speculation with nothing to base it on, is that I suspect the Traversal coprocessor is being made at Samsung, while the GPU dies will be made at TSMC. This would explain all the fanfare around the two foundries being used by Nvidia, with many speculating that there would be two tiers of GPUs depending on the foundry used. I think it's more likely that it's just a coprocessor that's made at Samsung. Now the $1000 question is, how does Ampere compare to Big Navi? I'll tell you what, you will want to stick around for the rest of this video, so don't go anywhere. But I'm just now deciding that I'll do something I've never done before, and honestly I hate it when people do this. So you'll have to forgive me, but I'm going to leave the best for last and cover RDNA 2 in a second part to be published shortly after this one. I'll compare Ampere and RDNA 2 then, and I will also discuss Intel's GPU, as well as a small surprise that might be coming from an unexpected source. So let's carry on and conclude the Nvidia stuff, because I've barely scratched the surface here. So Nvidia is releasing a GPU with a dedicated ASIC, and so what? AMD is releasing RDNA 2 in two of the year's biggest launches in technology, the Xbox Series X and the Darkwing Duck Cape Router. How can Nvidia possibly compete with $500 consoles that have a bunch of exclusives and at the very least basic real-time ray tracing? Well, how about Nvidia releasing its own console? <laughs> well, it's not a console in the traditional sense, it's not a box, unfortunately, I think that would actually be awesome. But that's because Nvidia doesn't need a box, it already makes GPUs and has a massive cloud infrastructure. All Nvidia needs to offer to compete with the couch experience that the consoles provide is a controller. In addition to Ampere, Nvidia is releasing a new controller to compete with next-gen consoles and with Stadia. I'm not 100% sure if this will be branded as Shield or if it will be called something else, and I'm not even sure if this will be announced alongside the Ampere GPUs or a bit later in the year, but this new controller is Nvidia's answer to AMD's dominance in consoles. In basic terms, this controller serves as a thin client, so instead of buying a high-end PC, or any PC really, you just buy this controller and it streams games to your TV or phone or tablet from Nvidia's game streaming service. This will also be affordable, at least by Nvidia standards, and this controller slash handheld console will have a dedicated processor inside, a network controller, obviously, and of course a battery. It will also have embedded memory to save games locally, and beyond the usual buttons and triggers on the controller, you will also be able to control games with your voice. I said in past videos that Nvidia would be adding new AI-related software features to their products, in addition to the LSS, because it's getting harder and harder to squeeze more performance out of hardware without prohibitive costs. For example, I can tell you that there's a 5 nanometer GPU that's estimated to be costing Nvidia $1 billion to make, but we'll discuss that one another time. So these software features like voice recognition that have been developed for other NVIDIA AI-related ventures are going to come to gaming products also. So this controller's strategy is basically the same as Stadia, but with a crucial difference. The controller connects directly to the Wi-Fi router or to a phone's 5G connection on the go. There's no intermediate device. There's no need for a shield tablet or a PC or a dongle, which means there will be much lower latency compared to Stadia. For a lot of people, a $100 controller plus a monthly fee might actually be all they need to satisfy their gaming needs, especially if they can't afford to spend $500 or more on a console plus $60 per game. Although most game streaming services have been crap so far, I wouldn't underestimate Nvidia on this one. Now, a GPU with a coprocessor and a new handheld device are cool and all, but what if I tell you that those are not even the most exciting things that Nvidia is releasing. There is at least another thing and it's quite special.
In addition to this controller, NVIDIA will also be releasing its own virtual reality headset. And it's not just yet another headset like the ones we've seen so far. Much like the new controller, this headset is going to be using many of the AI technologies that we've seen in demos in the last couple of years. For instance, NVIDIA's VR device will track your eyes for foveated rendering. In other words, it will use AI to track the position of your retinas, but also what you are looking at in the game and classify it. So if it's an object or a character, etc., to determine how it should best render the image, you might even be able to interact with certain elements of the game just by looking at them. You can expect to see a game like Slender, where if you look at the monster, some event gets triggered. The headset will be able to tell the game that you are looking at this character. Cool, right? But there's more. The most impressive part of Nvidia's VR headset, and what really sets it apart from all the other VR headsets out there is this. NVIDIA VR will also have a new type of screen, which is composed of two layers, each layer having a different resolution. The first screen layer is a low-resolution traditional LCD panel that only displays chroma information, so that's data that relates to color, while the second screen layer only displays luminance data. Now, this second display is high resolution and is capable of producing holographic images when used in this configuration. You've heard me right, NVIDIA will be releasing a VR headset capable of displaying holographic content at a super fast frame rate with a higher dynamic range and much more detail than any VR headset we've seen to date. To achieve high fidelity gaming, NVIDIA is using a PPU or parallel processing unit that will divide the source image into two sets of pixel blocks for each of these two panel layers. This VR headset will also make use of the new generation of DLSS to generate high resolution images from a small resolution source so that they match the resolution of this special new screen layer. And under consideration at NVIDIA is also the use of OLED that technology instead of a traditional LCD in the low resolution panel layer because OLED pixels can be modulated individually, something you can't easily do with LCDs, making OLED perfect for this new type of display. There's also a new optics array that NVIDIA has developed in-house that will allow their VR headset to preclude the need to adjust the lens, so you won't have to spend a lot of time adjusting the headset to your head and eye position. One of the most interesting technical aspects of this technology, at least for me, is that it just wouldn't be possible without NVIDIA's foray into artificial intelligence in the last decade or so. I've been a critic of NVIDIA's AI strategy in the past, mostly on the hardware front, but I've praised their AI software and algorithms multiple times, and it seems we're finally seeing all of those cool demos resulting in products that we gamers can enjoy. You see, unlike with other VR headsets, the image that will be displayed on NVIDIA's holographic VR headset doesn't actually exist. It's a reproduction of colors and luminance that are combined together from the output of an AI AI algorithm. You won't be seeing the actual frames of the games, you will be seeing a reconstruction made by AI that separates the image into these two layers in order to fool your brain into perceiving it as a holographic single image. This is some futuristic wacky shit right there. So contrary to popular belief, it sounds to me like Jensen has yet again managed to find a way out just as he was about to get cornered by AMD. But surely the hype around RDNA 2 is justified, and the exciting big numbers we're hearing about Big Navi will be enough to indeed smash and peer to the ground, right? A huge gigantic thanks to my patron Silverburn for his fantastic 3D models of the RTX 3080, and thanks to all my other patrons for their continued support. With YouTube CPM going down the toilet, it's getting harder and harder to make a living off of YouTube, so consider supporting my work on Patreon. And be sure to subscribe and hit the notification button so you don't miss the second part of this video where I'll cover AMD and Intel. Thanks for watching. And until the next one.